Ladies and gentlemen, warning. This line is going hot. Good morning and welcome to the second annual Rod of Iron Freedom Festival. How are y'all doing today? This is one heck of a show. Now here's the only thing that we're, I'm going to ask of you today. And that's to listen and be informed. Because here's what Alexander Hamilton wrote when they were forming these United States. If it be asked, what is the most sacred duty and the greatest source of our security in a republic? The answer would be an inviolable respect for the Constitution and our laws. And you know right now, that old Constitution and our laws are under attack. So we'd like to open this ceremony with the national anthem, and that's going to be conducted by the Rod of Iron musical director, Rio Tashiro. So if we could please stand for the national anthem. Here we go. As Tom Todd Beamer said, let's roll. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rocket red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the God bless America. What a rendition. That was perfect. And I heard some of the audience joining in. Let it, let it ring, people. Let it ring. Uh, we'd like to bring up now Pastor George Cook. Pastor Cook is going to give the invocation. And, you know, Pastor Cook, he has a tremendous message. So after the invocation, he's going to give you a little bit of uh, what he thinks is going on in the country, in America. So, Pastor Cook, there you go, sir. Thank you, Frank. Are you guys having a good time today? Are you having a good time today? So they asked me to give the invocation and not the provocation. The man who gives the invocation, the man who prays to open up the ceremonies sets the tempo, sets the stage for everything that happens thereafter, becomes the guiding beacon. And I thought about this, it's what America is supposed to be about, a guiding beacon, a guiding light to set the standard, to set the tone. We have a lot of friends here today from Japan. Everybody's from Japan. Give us a wave. Big wave. Our nations got intermingled through unfortunate circumstances. But today, Japan is influenced by America. And she learned what it meant to be a free capitalist nation. And today, Japan is a worldwide economic powerhouse. 
It's a first world country. I have a Sony camera in my pocket. I have a Nikon at home. Japan now influences the rest of the world because America influenced her. We have a lot of Korean friends here today. All my Korean friends, give me a wave. Come on. There you go. Hi, Yumi. You guys. Once again, America kind of got intertwined with Korea through unfortunate circumstances, right? But today, Korea learned through us being there by setting the standard, setting the tone, what it meant to be a free nation what it meant to be an economic powerhouse. Korea is a first world nation, at least South Korea is, right? I have a, um, I have a Samsung tablet in my Jeep that has a Hyundai engine in it. No one can say that they haven't been influenced economically by the great, wonderful South Korea. Freedom equals prosperity. And because America brought those ideas to our, our, our friends and our neighbors, they too are now prosperous. First world, powerhouses respected by the entire world. What a shame it would be if the light of America was extinguished. If all of a sudden, instead of being a beacon on a hill, it had a basket put over it. No one to set the standard. No one to set the stage. I'll tell you what that looks like. It looks like North Korea. That's what communist influence, socialist influence does to a country. And while our, our Asian friends come, they have plenty to eat. Our detached brothers in North Korea are starving to death because of communism. That's the difference. That's what it means to set the stage. That's what it means to be an American, and that's why we're here, to set the stage, to continue to be the light on the hill for the entire world to say, I'm going to be like them. In fact, I'm going to try to be better than them. Competition is good, and we welcome it. Yeah, you can applaud to that. Because when the, when the water rises, the ship rises with it. So as I pray, let's pray for that light on the hill. Gracious Heavenly Father, my Lord and my God, Lord, we stand before you. We beseech you, Father God. Lord, don't let the light of liberty and freedom and capitalism be extinguished in our land. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be a world leader. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed on America. Lord, we ask you to challenge us to continue to be a leader in the world. Lord, that other nations, Father God, that are now called third world nations, Lord, will, will embrace capitalism, that will embrace freedom, Father God. Lord, that they too would become first world nations and economic powerhouses. Lord, we denounce right now the evils of communism and all of its satanic works. Lord, we denounce those who take and practice what you now call socialism, Father God. Lord, we ask you to place a hedge of protection on Donald J. Trump. Lord, we ask you to place a hedge of protection on his beloved wife, Melania, and his entire family. Lord, we thank you for his rapid healing from a so-called Chinese disease, Father God. He vanquished in three days, Lord, what they said was supposed to kill him. Father God, we know that it was by your hand, by your might, by your power that healed our president. Father God, we ask your blessing on him right now as he is traveling to a, a rally, Father God. Lord, bless this land. Bless this nation. Lord, we commit even right now to you today that as you bless us, 
that we will continue to be the light on the hill and that we will bless other nations in your name. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. And I too. Fire and brimstone. And don't forget the millstone. The millstone is to be affixed to the pedophiles and cast off. Because that's what America does. Her people are her greatness. And you can see by the exposure of Hollywood and everything else that's been going on and been tolerated. Don't tolerate this any longer. But Pastor Cook mentioned the Lord, our good God. And the next two speakers that are going to come up have all had the hand of God touch them in some way. Their stories are they're unreal. They're fantastic, and they exist because of our God. So I'm going to bring up Mr. Ted Daniels. Ted Daniels is a father. He's a businessman. But he served. He served our nation. And while serving our nation, he was pinned down in a gunfight that no one should have survived. But somehow, some way, Mr. Daniels faced that evil head on, and by his lonesome, by himself, he charged the enemy while he was in Afghanistan. His story is one you'll never forget. I'd like to bring up my good friend, Mr. Ted Daniels. Hey, buddy. Thank you, Frank. And uh, Pastor Cook, how am I going to follow that? Wow. You know, now you guys got the second scariest guy here on the stage. And I have to say something. I'll tell you what, uh, the national anthem, I get teary-eyed every time I hear it and every time I see that flag flying. Do you know what did it for me today? We have amazing folks here from the other side of the world, from different countries. And as that national anthem played and I was rendering my salute, I looked out the corner of my eye and I saw everybody standing respectful for our national anthem. Thank you. Why is it that people born in this country, the professional athletes, want to disrespect that flag and everything that it stands for. What I saw this morning, about 15 minutes ago, touched me. And again, I get teary-eyed, and you all did that for me this morning. So thank you. Now, before I head into my story, let me tell you, I, I'm an off-the-cuff kind of guy. And this morning, when I left the house, I was going through my thoughts and what I wanted to say. But a couple things happened this morning that threw all that right out the window. So, Frank Scavo, myself, Stephen Williford, who's going to be up here in a bit, we all went last night, we did a fireside chat podcast with a bonfire and tiki torches. It was a group of Americans discussing what it means to be an American and how we have to stand up and fight the communist, Marxist, liberal enemy at the gate. So I went on this morning and I looked at some of the comments on there. Some guy wrote, he didn't look like me or Pastor Cook, I'll tell you that. This guy wrote, the tiki torches were appropriate for an event like that. Insinuating that it was a gathering of white supremacists. So this is what happens in this country now. If you believe in freedom, if you believe in the Constitution, you believe in our president, you are labeled a racist. So I couldn't help myself. I had to comment back to this person. And I said, 
You know, there's a dilemma in this country right now called the sissification of the American male. And why don't you just say what you want to say instead of hiding behind innuendos? Because at least then, maybe, I can have a shred of respect for you. Because right now, you're a coward, and I don't respect you because you don't want to say what you truly meant. Folks, we're under attack. We are at war in this country from a liberal ideology. The media is number one, and the education system is number two. And here's the second thing that set me off this morning. Steve Williford and I, we, we left my house. We, we go to a great little, great little restaurant not too far from here. They were one of the only restaurants in the area to stay open during the unconstitutional mask mandate. And they have a sign on their front door that says, you are not required to have a mask in here because we assume you may have a medical condition which prohibits you from wearing a mask. So we're not even going to ask you about it. As you can tell, I frequent that place a lot. So Steve and I ate, got in the car. car full of young people pulls up. They all put their masks on before they get out of the car. And they walk up to the door. And the one had a college sweatshirt on. They were young folks. You could tell they were college students. And they're reading what's on the door. And you could see the conversation that they were having with, with each other, that they were afraid to go in and eat. They walked around to the side takeout window. This is, in my opinion, because I've, I've been to other countries in this world, the greatest country on this planet. This is a country that affords you freedoms. Not through the hand of man, but through the hand of God. Amen. And these young people were so indoctrinated by the educational system in this country that they were afraid to go into a place to eat without putting a mask on knowing nothing would happen to them. This is how the media and the educational system in this country has indoctrinated folks. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. And i got to tell you, I'm thankful to be on this stage today. I wake up every day thankful to be six feet above ground. 2012, I was an infantry team leader in Afghanistan. We were an eight-man squad, and we got ambushed in the open on the side of a mountain. whole unit was pinned down. I picked up and moved. It came out into the open to draw that gunfire away from the rest of our squad. I took four bullets, and I found a rock on the side of this barren landscape about the size of this speaker. Now imagine a man my size. Just think about that. Fitting behind a speaker this size. Well, when you got machine guns coming at you, and you're scared to death, that's possible. Okay? That's possible. Now, as you can tell by looking at me, probably, I was not an angel as a child. There's a reason I'm wearing this shirt today. Because my mother, God rest her soul, she tried every day. Every single day. But I was that stubborn, bullheaded kid. I see Mike McKay over there. He's shaking his head. I was that stubborn, bullheaded kid that continued to do what I wanted to do and continued to get into trouble, but I didn't care because I thought I was right. I'm going to take a stand and I'm going to do what I want. I love you, Mom. 
I love you. You made me a better man. I had my talk with my maker behind that rock. I caught a round in the shin, one in the thigh, one in the back of the leg, and one through the shoulder. I was bleeding out. And I was getting down behind that rock. A round hit my rifle, knocked my rifle right out of my hands. I reached out to get the rifle. Rounds were exploding on the rocks all around me, covered in shrapnel. And it's amazing how when you're in a situation like that, what God will put in your head to get you to continue to fight. Who here has ever seen the Rocky movies with Mickey? Okay? Where Rocky has the flashbacks and it's Mickey saying, get up, I didn't hear no bell. God put a vision in my head of my young son at home. And two men, dressed blues, coming to the door to tell my son, your father was killed behind a rock in Afghanistan. And I had my talk, and we had a one-on-one. -on -one. We had a personal conversation right then and there. And I said, Lord, I realize I haven't led the best life in the world, but you gave me that life, and I'm thankful for it. And if the Today is the day that you are going to call me home, so be it. I'm at peace with that. I said, but Lord, my son, I want my son to know that I was a good man. I want my son to know that I went out fighting. So please, Lord, I got it. You're going to take me. But you got to let me go on my feet. Please. Please, God, let me go on my feet. I popped that magazine out. Threw a fresh one in. I'm being pinned down with PKM, AK-47 fire. Stood up. And, folks, this is the amazing part. Never... In my life, did I feel more at peace than I did at that moment. I had no worries. I had no fear. I'd given myself to God at that point. And I said, God, if you want to take me, I'm okay. And I stood up, and I started moving in the open towards the village that was shooting at me. I had a round skip off the side of my helmet. I had another bullet hit the corner of my sunglasses, and they just immediately disappeared from my face. And the entire time, I'm working my way down that hill. Targets are appearing. I'm engaging. And I'm winning. Got to a little stone wall at the bottom. And I was able to get down to that stone wall and sit back up against it. And I'm looking back up the hill, back to where I just came from. And I thought, God didn't take me. I'm still here. I'm still in the fight. After that incident, April 25th, 2012, it changed my life. I knew God had a purpose for me on this earth. God had a purpose for me on this planet. And I look at it this way, there's only two ways I'll ever be beat at anything. And that's if I quit or if I die. Quitting's never an option. Did God put me here to help fight against the evil that is encroaching in this country? Because, now let me start out. I'm not a politician. Politicians tell people what they want to hear. 
I'm a leader. I'm going to tell you what you might not want to hear. And we need to lead the charge. Our President Donald Trump, this man went to Washington, D.C. in 2016, and I love this analogy. He had a bag full of hand grenades, and he was pulling the pin and just tossing them. As he was walking around down there. That's what I love about the man, because he's a fighter. And we need more fighters. And we need more people who are going to stand up against the agenda to take this country. And there's another saying out there. If there's trouble, let it come in my time so that my children may live in peace. I have four sons. My youngest is three, and you're going to love his name. Jack Daniels. I should have named him Nyquil. Because he acts like you would expect a little boy named Jack Daniels to act. I need to fight for my son. I need to fight for my family. I need to fight for my friends. I need to fight for my community. I need to fight for everybody here today. These liberals are slimy. They're dirty, and they understand that there is no such thing as a fair fight. Unfortunately, the Republican Party has turned into the party of appeasement. And that's why we have gotten to where we are today in this country. The Republican Party says, ah, we're not going to fight them on this. We'll give in. We'll give in a little more here. We'll give in a little more there. That stops with President Donald Trump. This man does not give in. And not only do we need to stop appeasing and stop giving in, we need to draw that line in the sand and say, you know what? It's not going to happen anymore. My feet are dug in. You're not going to continue to push your agenda on me. You're not going to continue pushing socialism on me. Then we need to step over that line and start retaking ground. That's what we need to do. This country has afforded me so many great things. I did not come from a privileged background. Believe it or not, I was thrown out of three Catholic schools as a kid. But I think God looked down and said, you know what, here's a guy who's going to fight. And here's a guy I want in this fight to help beat back the evil that is at the door. So, it's an honor again to be here today. And Justin and Sean Moon, guys, you're incredible. I love both of you. I really do. Please give them a round of applause. So, this is called a segue. <laughs> I have the honor of introducing the next speaker today. In 2018, the NRA flew me to Dallas, Texas, to their national convention. And I was honored on stage at their national convention in Dallas. And I happened to meet a man there who was also being honored at that same convention, who I had seen on my TV for some crazy things he did about five months earlier. And I heard him speak, and I heard the passion in his voice. And I saw where his belief system stood. Here was a man who faced evil. Who saw evil the, way, the same way I saw evil. And that was looking down the end of a smoking barrel. 
That man saw what I saw. And we connected. We became friends. Now, that person is Stephen Williford. And let me tell you, I wish, I wish I could live my life the way Stephen Williford lives his life. Steve looks at me and probably thinks I'm a heathen. Stephen is a true man of God. I admire him for that. I respect him for that. Steve was in town last week. We, we met up for lunch. And my little boy, Jack Daniels, now you can imagine the hands. I'm going to have my hands full with this one, okay? My little boy straight, I'm telling him, I said, Jack, you're going to go meet a hero today. Now, he's three, and he doesn't understand what that is yet, but I wanted to plant that seed in his head. But this is a man that his father, he looks at his father as the toughest, strongest, best-looking guy in the room. And I wanted him to see that this is a man that his father admires, respects, and puts up on a pedestal. And I was honored when my wife and my son came to lunch and they actually got to meet and be around heroism, bravery, greatness, and a man of God. And Steve, I love you, brother. You know that? Come on out. Come on, buddy. I'm going to turn this over to Steve. Love this man. And I'm not ashamed to say that. And I think as men, it's okay to say that. Not in the leftist kind of way, but in a strong, right-wing kind of way where it's okay for one human being to say to another human being, I love you. Steve, I love you, brother. Thank you. Love you too, Ted. And by the way, uh, I just want you to know, little Jack is going to grow up around a hero wherever he is. Every day he's going to get up and see his daddy. You know, when I first met Jack Daniel, or Ted, I'm sorry, when I first met Ted, I said, I heard his story. I said, man, you're the guy. He said, what are you talking about? I said, you're him. He said, what are you talking about? I said, when I was seven years old, I played you when I played Army. Oh, I got shot. I'm going to go down and get him. That's Ted Daniels. Ever five, six, seven-year-old boy that played Army played Ted Daniels. And I want to thank him very much for being that hero for our country. I want to give you a little bit of my story today. November 5th, 2017, I was home relaxing in my bed because I decided that morning I was not going to get up and go to church. I normally went to church 40 miles away. But Monday morning, I was going to start my on-call at the hospital where I would have to carry a pager. And for 24 7, 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, 1 o'clock in the morning, I would have to answer that pager. Most of you millennials out there don't know what a pager is. It's this confounded little box that beeps, and it'll get to you where your phone won't find you, and you've got to answer it. So I knew I was going to work 20 to 30 hours extra that week. And I chose to stay home from church. At the time, we were building a house ourselves for our daughter and her husband. And my daughter was pregnant with my very first grandbaby. And we were building the house down the road, five miles down the road. So my wife said, if we're not going to church, I'm going to go work on Rachel's house. She was taping and floating the walls, and my wife can do anything she sets her mind to. She's the most amazing person I've ever met in my life. God bless me. I'm, I'm married up. 
I'm okay with that. This is all taken, by the way. So I stayed home from work that uh, from church that day. My older daughter was engaged to be married. And so she moved back in the house with us so that when she got married, she wasn't tied to an apartment lease that she could move in with her husband. So she moved back home with us until she got married. And if you're going to live at my house rent-free, you're going to do chores. That morning she was washing dishes and she heard it. She came running into my bedroom. I'm checking the phone out and looking at my emails and stuff. She said, Dad, doesn't that sound like gunfire to you? Right away, your mind goes to try to make something normal out of something that is very abnormal. I said, it sounds like someone tapping at the window. And I went and opened the curtain and I couldn't see anything. She said, come into the kitchen. As soon as I walked out of my bedroom, I realized it was gunfire. I ran to my safe to get my rifle out. My daughter ran outside, jumped in her car, and went up the street to find out what was going on. I grabbed a rifle out of my safe. I grabbed the ammunition and started poking rounds into it. I just grabbed a handful. And I called my wife. I said, where are you at? She said, I'm at Rachel's house. What's wrong? She could tell the panic in my voice. And I said, there's someone shooting up the church. She said, don't go over there, and I hung up on her. She did whatever wife would do with concern for her husband, and later she said, I knew you were going over there. What could I do? My daughter came running in and told me, Dad, there's a guy in black tactical gear shooting up the church. I said, did you call 911? She said, I did. They're aware of it tells me the police are coming as fast as they can to a mass shooting at a church and I'm running across the street with a rifle in my hands. They're going to think I'm the shooter. But my community didn't have time to wait. We're 600 people total in Sutherland Springs. Little bitty small community and we are tight knit. I know every one of those people in that church and they can't wait. I ran out the street told my daughter to go back in and load me another magazine, knowing she couldn't come back and hand it to me in a gunfight. And I knew it would be over before she had a chance to. But I wanted her out not following me, doing something to keep her busy. She ran back in the house, and the Holy Spirit took over me. And as I ran across the street, I yelled out, that was not a good tactical decision at all to give up my element of surprise that I was coming and I yelled out. And why did I yell out? Jesus, when he walked into the garden with the possessed men, the demons within them said, we know who you are. Have you come here to torment us before our time? Jesus drove those demons out into the pigs. The pigs ran over the cliff and died. We all know the story. I believe it was that same voice that cried out and called the demon out that was in that man that day. He had just shot Chris Workman in the back. Chris was our praise ministry leader at that church. He shot his mother through the breast and he was walking over to finish them all when he heard me cry out. Immediately, he came outside and started shooting at me. He started shooting at me, and I saw my worst nightmare. I saw a man with class three body armor, a ballistic bulletproof helmet, and a pistol. He hit the truck in front of me, shattered the windshield of the car behind me, hit the house behind me, and the Holy Spirit told me, don't worry about that. Do what I sent you here to do. I put a round in his left chest, stopped by the armor. I put one in his abdomen, stopped by the armor. But he stopped shooting at me for a moment and went to get into his vehicle. And when he turned to his side, I shot him in the side between the two plates. 
I shot him in the legs. He got in his vehicle. He put two more shots through the side window. And I saw the glass open up and fall. I put one where I perceived his head to be. I couldn't see it because of the reflection from the glass. And it broke all the way across his forehead. He accelerated, ran down the street, 150 yards away. I put one last shot through the back window, shattered the back window, went through the driver's side seat and hit him just right of the shoulder blade. Those were amazing shots. And I believe God himself directed them. I'm not saying that to brag. <laughs> I'm like David facing Goliath. David hit Goliath in the middle of the forehead with a slingshot at a rock that was probably flying 900 foot per second. The hand of God was on me and I watched him top that hill and say, he can't end this way, he's getting away. I turned to my left and I looked and there's a pickup truck sitting at the stop sign. I ran over and I tapped on the window. Now you got to look at this in your mind's eye. Crazy man running right barefoot. I didn't put shoes on, I didn't have time. Taps on the window, says that man just shot up the Baptist church and we gotta stop him. Any sane man in this world would have just put the pedal to the floor and drove off and left me at the stop sign. But this is Texas we're talking about. We're not known for our sanity. Yeah. <laughs> Next thing I heard were the locks pop open climbed up in the cab with a long, tall Texan, probably 6'3", thin build, white western hat, big feather sticking out of the hat, toothpick hanging out of his mouth. He never lost his toothpick. Long horn skull tattooed in the middle of his neck and the horns running up underneath his ears. I didn't know his name. Didn't know anything about him except his courage to let me in that truck. He accelerated as fast as he could. We were out chasing him in a heartbeat. We chased him 11.6 miles. We chased him 11.6 miles. And in the end, he called his wife and his father and said, I've done something horrible. He turned the gun to himself and committed suicide. And I'm okay with that. The heroes within our church, like Julie Workman, I referenced her. She'd been shot through the breast, one put through her leg. She was bleeding from her own wounds and got up and started tying tourniquets and saving lives in the church. Gunny Macias, a Marine, a retired Marine. Nobody seems to know Gunny's first name. They just call him Gunny. When the pastor came later to visit him in the hospital, they said, I need to see Gunny Macias. And the lady says, you know how many Gunnies there are? It was at Wolford Hall, or um, SAMHSA, our nation's biggest military hospital. They said, you know how many Gunnies there are? Nobody seems to know Gunny's name. Gunny was shot five times in the abdomen. He couldn't even stand. And the Marine and him started parking orders, telling people what they needed to do to save their lives. And then he yells out, hallelujah, hallelujah, even in this, praise God. And then a little seven-year-old girl came to Gunny and said, Gunny, I'm scared. And Gunny started singing, Jesus loves me with her. What a Marine, what a man. My community has too many heroes to even speak of at this. But I want to talk today about, I want to go from there to our gun rights and talk about defending our gun rights. How many of you out here in the audience, was Donald Trump not your first choice? Okay, Donald Trump was not my first choice, and I'm going to tell you a little bit why he was not my first choice. I'm from Texas. Texans love Texas. We are the greatest state in this United States. I love Texas. 
And I've got this brazen New Yorker, New Yorker, talking with that New York attitude, that New York accent. Texans don't like New Yorkers that talk that way because they almost like New York as much as we do Texas. And I had a hard time with that. And I had a hard time with that because I saw all the pictures with Donald Trump and Bill and Hillary Clinton, and I didn't trust him. Me, I was a Ted Cruz man, good Texas boy. You know, I'm supporting him. I'm going to vote for Ted Cruz. He's, he's it. He's the way to go. And Donald Trump is standing up there saying, you elect me president. I'm going to build the wall. That's important to Texans. Yeah, he's not going to do that. All the politicians say that. Because if you elect me president, I'm going to move our embassy to Jerusalem. Yeah, the Bushes said that. Obama even said that. That's not going to happen. If you elect me president, I'm going to renegotiate NAFTA. As a Texan, that's important. We get Mexican trucks coming across the border. They don't have to pass any of our inspections. They don't have brakes. They're the most dangerous thing in the world. And you guys don't know about it. But we do in Texas because we're on that border. We see it. And he says he's going to renegotiate NAFTA. Yeah, that's not going to happen. And then he says, I'm going to renegotiate our agreements with China. Yeah, they're the juggernaut. Nobody wants to take on China. They're the up and coming economy. We're not going to be able to handle that. And he's just making another false promise. And he's out there saying these things, and he says, I'm going to appoint Supreme Court justices that are conservative. Yeah, that's not going to happen either, right? I mean, just after he was elected, we got Gorsuch. We got a new deal with NAFTA. We got a, a wall going up in Texas. Well, wait a minute. This guy's for real. This guy is for real. I didn't trust him. Now, all of a sudden, every promise that he made, I held my nose and I voted for him because surely he's got to be better than Hillary. Okay? But now I'm thinking, wait. God, I'm glad I voted for him. He's actually doing the things that he said. I'm starting to trust politicians to take them for their word. Everything he has done is what he said he was going to do. If you're not paying attention, how, who else in this world would have been able to get accomplished what he has accomplished? And I believe not even Ted Cruz had, could have done that. Ted Cruz couldn't have been hammered like Donald Trump has been hammered. Donald Trump was the right man for the job, and I don't care how brazen he is. If you're going to do what you promised to do, then let's, let's see it. Let's make it happen. And now I'm beginning to believe politicians. And since I started believing politicians, I've got to believe all of the politicians. I have to believe Joe Biden now. It says to the gun manufacturers... If I'm elected president, I'm coming after you, our good gun manufacturers, like Justin over here. There's no easier way to take away your rights to own a gun than to put all these guys out of business. And Remington's on the ropes right now. He took and he said, Beto O'Rourke, little Bobby O'Rourke, I don't call him Beto, his name's Bobby, Robert Francis O'Rourke. He's as Irish as they get, but he calls himself Beto because he wants to be racial fluid, be whoever he wants to be. He says he's going to make Beto O'Rourke 
his, his guns are. That's O'Rourke that stood up and said, hell yeah, I'm taking away your AK-47s and your AR-15s. I'm coming for you. And then he turns around and appoints Kamala Harris as his vice presidential candidate. And Kamala Harris said, if I'm elected president, I'm going to give Congress 100 days to enact gun control and take every semi-automatic gun away from you, the people. What are they afraid of? I have to believe it. And believe me, if you elect, let him be elected. She will be president before it's over. No mistake here. Joe Biden is not going to finish his term. She will be president, and she's coming for your guns, right alongside little Bobby. I'm going to tell you, there's a meme that's out there recently that I saw. It said, I wish Americans loved America like Texans love Texas. And I believe it, because we, we love our state. And I'm sure there's some Pennsylvanians out there that love Pennsylvania, almost as much as we love Texas. My wife is from St. Louis, Missouri. She said she'd never marry a Texan, should never live in Texas, never tell God what you won't do. So she married a Texan. She moved to Texas. She didn't want to move to Texas because Texans are arrogant about their state is what she used to say. Now she just knows we're right. I talk a lot about Texas because I love my, my state, but I love my country too. And I don't know, I don't like where we're going. And it's going to take patriots to get out there and bring your neighbors, bring your friends, get them out there, get them to vote. I'm not in Texas now because we got it sewed up in Texas. We're red. You guys are so important here because it's not sewn up here and you have to make Pennsylvania red. Please make Pennsylvania red for your children, for your grandchildren. And I'm going to wrap this up with a quote from another great president. Ronald Reagan said, freedom is no more than one generation away from extinction. It wasn't passed down to us through the bloodline, but it must be fought for and protected and handed to the next generation for them to do the same thing. Let it never be said in my twilight years, I'm trying to explain why we, meaning our generation, let these freedoms go and our children don't know them. We need to reelect Donald Trump. We need to con continue to be the Christian nation that this nation was born to be and follow our God and keep this nation a nation of the people for the people. God bless you guys and thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a common thread here, and it's not only freedom and liberty, it's the hand of God. And I'm going to share another, and the way these things line up and the way God works, you know, it's just so clear. So yesterday I'm cruising up Interstate 84 to come to the Rod of Iron Festival, and the last time I saw Steve Bannon of Breitbart and the 2016 CEO of the Trump campaign that helped to elect Donald Trump against all odds, I cruise it up and my cell phone rings. And it's Steve Bannon's main contact, Alex. I pick it up and I said, hey, what's up, Alex? She goes, Steve Bannon wants to help. Are you having any events that he could come to or Skype into? And I was 
floor. And I said, Alex, I'm on my way to the Rod of Iron Freedom Festival. There'll be thousands of people there. And she goes, can you call in today? <laughs> I, I said, I'll check when I get there. So I, I spoke with Robert. He's one of our IT wizards. And lo and behold, at 2 p.m., Steve Bannon calls in. So let me get, read to you a little bit about Steve Bannon because he is our next special guest that's going to address you. And this is, this is quite a privilege. So Steve Bannon, who is Steve Bannon? Uh, Steve Bannon is a veteran. Are, are there any veterans here? We must, this, could, this would not be possible without our veterans. Future veterans, past veterans, current serving military members. The United States military is the, the largest power that threatens no one unless they threaten these United States. So it, it's just, I'm in awe of all veterans, especially, you know, Mr. Ted Daniels, he's, he's kind of modest. If it wasn't for Donald Trump and the Veterans Promise, which is where a veteran's choice, where you can go outside of the VA, he would have his leg amputated today. So if it wasn't for Donald Trump winning in 2016 and de defeating Hillary and all the evil that, that goes with it and the bureaucracy, Teddy would have been up here today, but he would have some type, type of prosthetic. So if you're considering anyone else other than, than Donald Trump, think about our veterans, those that walk the line or are on the line. But I get away from Mr. Steve Bannon, who's also a veteran. He was a surface warfare officer serving in the Western Pacific, Arabian Sea, and the Persian Gulf. Those are hotbeds. He was on the line. He served at the Pentagon as a special assistant to chief of naval operations. And he was the chairman of Breitbart for many years, and then he left to become the CEO of Donald Trump's 2016 historic campaign, where he went against all odds. Then he was the White House chief strategist. He fights for Americans like you all do, 24-7. He has a radio talk show. It's on every day. It's called The War Room. So if you have not tuned into Steve Bannon's radio show yet, it's a must, especially with 23 days left to go before the election. But here's what he knows. Steve Bannon knows the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. And they have attacked and targeted him and targeted you all Americans also. But that does not stop him from fighting for America first. So at 11.59 on this Sunday afternoon, we're going to bring on live via Skype, Mr. Steve Bannon. Please welcome Steve Bannon. Frank, Frank, thank you so much. And um, it's a great honor to be uh, invited to speak at the Rod of Iron Conference. Look, the reason that uh, I wanted to talk to you today, and I'm so appreciative of, uh, of Justin and Pastor Sean uh, allowing me to uh, address this conference, is that 250 flag officers sent a letter to President Trump about three or four weeks ago. Uh, one of them was Tom Hayward, uh, a Navy fighter pilot, who was the chief of naval operations? That I was a young A2 back in the early 1980s, after I came off the of sea duty. And what they said is that this is the most important election in the history of the republic. And the reason is we're at a crossroads right now. We are either going to continue to be the republic that has been bequeathed to us by 13 or 14 generations of Americans, American patriots, or we're going to turn into something radically different. And you've seen over the last five or six months what, that, what that's going to be. Anarchy in the streets, cultural Marxism, uh, the, the demise of capitalism, and really the continuing partnership of our elites with the Chinese Communist Party. Now, Donald Trump is the first, really, American politician to stand up to the Chinese Communist Party and tell them that we're going to start bringing manufacturing jobs back to the United States and we're going to stop the nonsense that's going on 
whether that's in Taiwan, the South China Sea, or up on the border of India. You know, Donald Trump is focused on confronting China from day one. Now, here's the, here's the fight we've got in front of us. The mass media is so uh, traumatized their, the Democratic base that nobody in the Democratic Party wants to come out and vote on November 3rd. So they want to do mail-in ballots. And that is a perfect way, a setup for them to steal a victory by Donald Trump. Every indicator shows us right now that 69% to 75% of the Democratic Party is afraid to come out because of this pandemic. They're afraid to come out and vote in person on November 3rd. Uh, 75% of Trump followers have absolutely no problem with showing up on November 3rd and voting. So late in the evening, late in the evening, and forget all the polls, forget all the polls you're seeing right now. All of those polls, all those national polls that show Trump 10, 12, 14 points down to Biden are all psychological warfare suppression polls. Four years ago, today, Donald Trump was down by 12 points. We were just coming off Billy Bush weekend, and we ended up winning. And Pennsylvania was absolutely the key to take the lot for our victory. And Pennsylvania is going to be the most important state in the victory in 2020. Now, here's what's going to happen. President Trump is actually up 21 to 22 points on those people who are going to come out on Election Day and vote. So by 10, 11 o'clock at night on the 3rd of November, President Trump will be heading towards a landslide victory. What the left intends to do, and you've seen it in Pennsylvania right now, use the courts. Use social media, use the mainstream media to try to make sure that Trump is not declared the winner that night. And by going in and extending the voting, by going in and uh, making sure that every uncertifiable ballot tries to count, they're going to try to steal the presidency from him over the next three or four weeks. If the vote is not certified by the Secretary of State by December 8th, and therefore goes to the Electoral College at the state capitals, individual state capitals, by the 14th of December, the election of the president will be in to the House of Representatives, presided over by Nancy Pelosi. But we vote... Well, we vote by state delegation. Every state gets one vote based upon the state delegation of, of, of their House of Representatives. Right now, it's 26 Republicans, 26 to 3 Democrats, in one tie. And yes, you're right, that tie is to be the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. That is... What has to happen is that we have to bind together and understand that Election Day is just one part of this process, all the way to make sure that President Trump raises his hand at noon, high noon, on the 20th of January, 2021, and begins his second term. Now, how are we going to do that? Number one, we need everybody to get out, every person, every relative, every colleague, every friend, to the polls on the 30th of November to vote. In addition, you've got to volunteer to be poll watchers. The Democrats have a whole system of how they're going to try to vote by the pound, particularly in certain areas of Pennsylvania. In addition, you've got to volunteer to be election officials. We need tough people, smart people, dedicated people, patriots, like the Rod of Iron Ministries and the Rod of Iron Conference. We need you in the room as an election official to monitor the vote. All of the certification process is going to take place of all these mail-in ballots. 
And right now, remember, we're talking about maybe 50, 60, 80 million mail-in ballots. They all have to be certified. And in Pennsylvania, you have a quite complicated certification process dealing with numerous envelopes, signatures, post postmarks. So we need you today to contact your local Republican Party and your local canvassing board and volunteer to be an election official. This is the most important thing you can do. In addition, starting on the night of the 3rd, Twitter, Facebook, all of it are going to try to be putting out false information about President Trump's victory on the 3rd. And we need everybody to look at alternative social media sites to make sure you're going to all the great uh, anti-drudge news sites that are up there in the conservative movement uh, to make sure that you're totally wired in. As gr much as I love Fox and as great as Fox is, they're going to be under enormous pressure, enormous pressure, not to, not to call President Trump's victory. So you're going to have to have alternatives. And just remember, this fight is going to continue through November. It's going to continue through December. It's going to continue to, to uh, January in the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C., all the way to the 20th of January. Look, we're going to win this thing. We're going to win on game day. We've got tremendous momentum. President Trump's campaign is starting to hit on all cylinders. They're doing a paid chase program right now. They're coming up with new advertising. President Trump's going to be not just a rally. He's going to be online nonstop between now and Election Day. So we've got to deliver Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is the key that picks the lock for a second Trump term. I'm honored to be asked to speak here today, and I've told Frank, I've told, I've told Justin and Pastor Sean, I'm available for the Rod of Iron Ministries, and I'm available for the Rod of Iron Conference, and for all attendees 24-7. You can see our show from 10 to noon in, in the morning. You can see a podcast or online. You can get to my guide. I will talk at any conference, any group, anything to motivate people to get out to vote, because as the flag officer said, this is the most important election in the history of the Republic. I want to thank you guys. Thank you so much for, 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 for bearing with me. God bless you, Frank. Thank you, brother. Ladies and gentlemen, that, that's the message. And I can tell you this. I haven't missed an election since I've been 18. I mean, I physically go, and I meet the people. And it's a great day. It's a great event. If you've never done it, you heard Steve Bannon, now is our time, now is your time. Working in the polls. All you're doing is making sure that it's going straight, that it's going according to plan. All you're doing is making sure that there aren't busloads of people which show up and just happen to vote. So you'll be asking simple questions. It's easy. But what you need to do today is commit to it. And then when you go into work tomorrow, you say, hey, I'm giving you two weeks notice. I need Tuesday, November 3rd off. I need to take that day off. Because it's absolutely critical. That's what you can do. You can do the Facebook, you talk to family, okay. But Steve just told you where it's going to go down, where it's going to happen. You saw they already threw out nine military ballots in Luzerne County. It already started. Those are nine ballots for Donald Trump. How come there weren't six corresponding ballots for Joe Biden? Or Kamala Harris, whatever that ticket is. Because they're starting already. And that's where you have to be the citizens, the watchdogs. So we can pray, but we also need to have a plan. Plan A, no plan B, because if we lose this, you're steps away from the conservative constitutional republic that is here now. But I'm going to bring up our next speaker, Pastor Sean Moon. Pastor Moon has the message. He has the answers, and the answers are from above. Pastor Moon is the vessel that delivers the message, but it's, us to, uh, up to, it's up to us to deliver on what the Word of God is. And that continues. That Word of God was written so long ago, 
but it still holds true today. So, Pastor Sean Moon, by the way, this is an open carry event. Pastor Sean Moon has his gold-plated, that is an AR-15. I also have a 45. You're surrounded by good guys with guns. And I, I guarantee you feel very comfortable today in our presence. So, Pastor Sean, take it away. God bless you, folks. Let's give it a one time for Teddy Daniels, Stephen Williford, Steve Bannon, and of course, Frank Scobble, everybody. Incredible. Incredible. Good morning, Patriots, supporters of the Second Amendment, responsible gun owners and believers made in the image of God. Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Welcome for the second day here at the beautiful Car Arms property for the Rotter Iron Freedom Festival. We are honored to have you all here. I hope you're enjoying your, the incredible God-given gifts of freedom that we here in America can still enjoy. We encourage you to visit the Vietnam War Memorial there to pay respect to all our fallen heroes from wars past to present. Again, I want to also acknowledge the planning committee and our friends and volunteers and their families who are making this event possible. Let's give it up one time for all those folks. Also, again, we are happy to be joined here by other freedom fighters from around the world who are fighting in their respective countries for a Second Amendment that we enjoy and often take for granted here in the U.S. If the right to keep and bear arms is a natural right, like our framers stated, then it is a human right. And all human beings should have the right of self-defense against tyranny. Just to recap, our church celebrates this day as a day of freedom as my father, the Reverend Sun Myung Moon, who our tradition honors as a returning Jesus, suffered and was imprisoned at Hung Nam Death Camp for preaching the gospel under North Korean communism. He launched the world's largest anti-communist movement of churches in the world. And he started major newspapers like the Washington Times and Sege Ilbo in Korea to educate and warn the public of the dangers of communism. This awareness of the deadly nature of communism did not simply arise out of a reactionary response to communist oppression. It stemmed from his immense biblical knowledge and prayer life. He always taught his church that communism was Satanism, and that Satan was using what seemed to be a political ideology to spread the kingdom of Satan over this world. There is a reason why Marxism has created socialist and communist regimes all over the world, that have collectively killed and murdered over 220 million of their own citizens in the 20th century alone. If you killed one person every minute, it would take you 418 years to kill 220 million people. The blood of those people screaming for liberty and freedom cries out from the earth till this day. And we will never, never forget the truth of Marxism socialism and communism as political Satanism. Today I will argue for 10 reasons why communism and the 10 planks of Marx is a veiled political Satanism. Number one, communism is political Satanism because it wants the abolition of private property. Marx argued for abolition of private property in terms of the means of production. He argued that factories and industrialized businesses are built and sustained by the us usurper or owner, having full control of the mini means of production, like the building, the machines, manufacturing lines, etc. He claimed that the owners were exploiting the work of the laborer, and thus the laborers must be able to gain control over the factory, machines, or means of production through government. But the owner had to start the business at total risk to himself and his family. The owner had to grow the business, assuming total risk for failure. The owner had to grow it far enough in free interaction with customers, with no coercion, to create profits for reinvestment to buy better means of production, and so he owns those means of production. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 15, God commands, Thy sh you shall not steal. In Matthew 15, verse 19 and 20, theft is one of the many acts that come from the heart of a defiled man. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9 says, Thieves will not enter the kingdom of God. 
Socialism takes the factory and means of production over by force of government and must thus di disarm the population. In reality, this means the government becomes a criminal agency of theft and robbery. The state centralizes all resources stolen by force to itself, which is controlled by politicians and, of course, their funders. Thus, the abolition of private property is a justification for government to steal and rob business owners of their means of production. This immoral system, fundamentally based on course of theft, is not of God, but of Satan. Number two, communism is political Satanism as it demands a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. America was free from income tax for nearly 100 years. A heavy graduated income tax entails centralizing government and law enforcement to coercively steal more from people with higher productivity. Communist churches, quote, render unto Caesar what is unto Caesar, and unto God what is God's. But Caesar means king, and our Constitution makes we the people the king and Caesar of this land, which is in line with Scripture, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, where Christ makes us kings and priests unto God and to his Father. So the government should render unto the people, as the Caesar, all that is ours, our freedom, and 100% of what we produce. What we charitably choose to do with what, is, what we produce is up to our free will. Government cannot coerce charity. Income tax is enforced by coercion and always unequivocally leads to the disarmament of the people. But governments cannot forcibly take from a person because the person is not created by government, but by God. Stealing from the person is thus stealing from the maker of the person who endowed that person with gifts to produce the fruits of his labor. Christians are co-heirs with Christ, the creator of the universe, and not servants of governments. As Isaiah 54 states, For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. Number three, communism is political Satanism as it seeks the abolition of all rights of inheritance. Satan desires to abolish the vertical transmission of God's blessing, of dominion from one generation to the next. In Genesis chapter 2, God blesses Adam and Eve, saying, Be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion over the earth. A central pillar of the God of the Bible is that God desires to inherit creation to man. Satan was opposed to God's desire and stole the inheritance of Adam and Eve, humanity, and became the ruler of the earth. Even generations after the fall, God expresses the same desire of inheritance to his chosen providential figures. In Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. In Numbers 36 verse 9, the Bible says, Each of the tribes of the people of Israel shall hold on to its own inheritance. In Psalm chapter 2 and verse 8, God affirms his desire to inherit creation to his people, saying, Ask of me, and I will give the heathen nations for thy inheritance and the ends of the earth for thy possession, and you shall rule them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like the potter's vessel. In Galatians 4 and 7, he states to the believer, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Here we can see God frees us from sin and Satan. We are no longer servants of the power of, of this world, but sons and daughters of Almighty God, where we become heirs to his kingdom of heaven on earth, through Christ. Number four, communism is political Satanism as it calls for confiscation of the, quote, property of all immigrants and, quote, rebels. The aim of Marx here was to take the resources of the, quote, counter-revolutionaries and, quote, bourgeoisie capitalists who he believed would resist his forced social reconstruction. From a Christian perspective, God gives different gifts to different people. Not all will make million-dollar businesses. Some will be great educators. Some will be great coaches. Some will be great scientists. Some will be great doctors. Not all will be managers that can produce and run factories and business operations. When those who produce factories and businesses employing hundreds of people are coerced by the state 
either by burdensome taxes, regulations, or outright takeover, those individuals who made those businesses will leave to another more free country. By designating the producers as potential rebels, Marx forcefully guarantees all opposition to his centralization of power be eliminated. All of this is done by coercion, not by free will, and thus the communists, socialists, Marxists, like Satan, seek to coerce their desire, instead of letting people freely choose how to organize society, interacting freely with one another. When people freely interact without government intrusion, Christian morality, a hard work ethic, reputation, keeping promises and contracts, raising capable and moral children, all become behaviors that build trust with business partners, community members, and society at large. This positive incentivization of good behavioral traits improves society as a whole. Government intrusion and coercion disrupts these interactions, creating incentives to join in the growing of the power of the state, and thus of coercion, and thus of corruption. Number five, communism is political Satanism, as it calls for the centralization of credit into the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. Luke chapter 16 and verse 13, Christ says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Here, mammon means materialism and worldly gain. Mayor Amzal Rothschild, international banker, stated, Permit me to issue and control the money of a nation, and I care not who makes us laws. James Madison and Thomas Jefferson warned that the greatest threat to be feared was the public curse of public debt, and the banking establishments are more dangerous than standing armies. Christopher Gadsden, a revolutionary leader, in September 1764 said, The evils attending a wanton exercise of power in some of the colonies by issuing a redundancy of paper currency has always been avoided by this province by a proper attention to the dangerous consequences of such a practice and the fatal influence it must have upon public credit. Writer Jason Charles warns that the central bank is a Trojan horse. Once inside a host country, it begins to take over the process of money regulation and lending. Having achieved this, corporations and governments are encouraged to take out large amounts of debt to stimulate industry. After many years of free access to money, corporate and governmental organizations have developed products, manufacturing, infrastructure, and housing and commercial centers within the nation with this influx of cash. At a predetermined time sent by the banking elite, the central bank begins to dry up credit by artificial means, throwing whole sectors into financial ruin, causing layoffs, downsizing, bankruptcy of vital institutions within the nation. The bankers can then use their vast wealth to buy up, consolidate, and merge their own entities with that of the state, further increasing their stranglehold on the nation. Proverbs 22, verse 7, says, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is the servant of the lender. Here, believers are to avoid debt, as one becomes a slave to the lender, and may have to compromise his ethics as a means of paying off the debt. At the time, being yoked to debt could be used as leverage against the believer, such as sexual favors or participating in idol worship, etc. Deuteronomy 23 and verse 19 warns against usury or the charging of interest for the sake of exploitative profits, which central banks employ to lend out fiat, fiat currency and collect on real collateral assets. This system of central banking goes against God's desire for humanity to be sovereign owners of creation and thus perpetuates an arrangement that fosters usury and centralization of real assets to the international shareholders of the bank. Thus, it is founded on the sin of usury and then enslavement of the population, which would represent political Satanism and not God. Number six. Communism is political Satanism as it seeks the, quote, centralization of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state. Centralizing media and communications creates an environment where the political class will be able to control the messaging that the population consumes. It also allows the state to track the mo movements of a free peoples through controlling roadways and public transport, etc. 
We see this today with government control of the Internet, resulting in censorship, banning of accounts, and arrests in some countries for dissenting views against the infallibility of government. We see the rampant misinformation campaigns and propaganda used to sway the masses, masses to support anti-freedom candidates, even though they're senile and cannot string together a full sentence. We see media being utilized to promote illegal, unscientific, unconstitutional, face mask muzzling orders punishable by fines in some leftist areas of the U.S. People are seen wearing masks in their own cars while riding a bike outside or while on a beach in the open air. The governor of California warns diners to mask up between bites at restaurants. This type of totalitarian overreach is facilitated by state-run media and transportation as if you resist, you can be easily tracked by phone, video surveillance of your traveling patterns at toll booths, highways, and of course ordered to pay fines or be arrested. This diminution of human sovereignty and increase in central governmental power displays the will of Satan, not God. As the word says in Galatians chapter 5, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Number seven, communism is political Satanism as it, quote, implements extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state, end quote. In order for the state to own factories and instruments of production, it must again coercively rob the owners of such accoutrements and thus commits acts against God by stealing that which the state did not create. It again must disarm the people, people gifted with the ability to produce products and services that people will freely trade for, are exercising their God-given abilities for win-win, non-coercive interaction. The state tyrannically claiming to own these instruments of production when it clearly stole from the citizen the instruments of production is a blatant form of totalitarian robbery. Thus, the extension of factories and instruments of production to be owned by the state is fundamentally immoral and unjust and rooted in Satan. Communism, number eight, communism is political Satanism as it, quote, demands equal liability of all to labor. This plank of Marx theoretically forces all to engage in menial labor, but in practicality takes all incentives away to innovate, produce technology to create efficiency, as people are not allowed to have a profit motive. If a free people cannot somehow benefit their livelihood or family by innovating and becoming more efficient in production of goods, people will simply take the le least path of resistance and do what is minimally required by the state. If the menial work is mandated and all get standardized stipends, whether one innovates or not, innovation collapses. This, of course, is the reason why communist and socialist economies are the least innovative, least efficient, least technologically advanced, and economically impoverished, i.e. Venezuela, former Soviet Union, or North Korea. Leftists, of course, always point to Scandinavian socialism, which is not a socialism at all. It is a combination of socialist taxation combined with very free markets. 50% taxes on income in Scandinavia, but almost no corporate tax and lots of economic capitalism with free markets. Number nine, communism is political Satanism as it seeks the combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries, gradual abolition of the distinction between town and country by a more, quote, equitable di distribution of the population over the country. Similar to the aforementioned planks, this forced attempt to combine agriculture and manufacturing by the state run by incompetent government officials always fails. With no freedom of market interaction and no allowance of people in these fields to make profits, the state kills all incentives for business owners to take the risk of merging industry. Number 10, communism is political Satanism as it implements, quote, free education for all children in public schools, but really gives free indoctrination. Although it is debatable whether Marx was for government schools, this is an inevitable byproduct of centralizing so much power to the state. Although Marx did not exclusively write clearly about education, he believed that schools reinforced class inequality through testing, grades, and obedience to the hierarchy of capitalism. 
Ironically, succeeding generations of Marxists thought Marx focused too much on class inequality and not enough about gender inequality or race inequality or sexual inequality. This has resulted in the youth being indoctrinated to hate meritocracy and create a culture of victimology, which can all be, of course, remedied, as they say, with more government funding, which entails, of course, more government robbery from productive members of society. Thus, communism, Marxism, socialism is political Satanism. Like a plague or cancer, it strengthens the power of centralized government, which in the words of George Washington, is force, a dangerous servant, and a brutal master. To create a culture where actual immorality, licentiousness, killing, and profiteering off of government power thrives. Marxism, socialism, communism creates an atheistic, Christian-hating culture, which seeks to destroy the heteronuclear family, weaken marriage bonds, promotes sexual immorality, promotes genocide of unborn babies, and promotes robbery through taxation, pillaging and plundering through confiscation of property, and the rabidly cruel disarmament of the people. We call on President Trump, together with all the free nations of the world, to punish the Marxist Chinese Communist Party, as China must pay for unleashing a biological weapon upon the world that has devastated millions of lives with disease, death, economic devastation, and the implementation of Chinese communist worldwide lockdowns, surveillance, arrests, and government abuse of power. Over 60% of American small businesses will be killed by these lockdowns, and we are being forced to essentially shop in China every day as Walmart and Amazon are both massive carriers for goods made in China. President Trump and the free world can begin by enacting harsh tariffs, taxes, arresting spies that are in our respective countries, and arresting any and all politicians with monetary ties to the Chinese Communist Party as enemies of the state. If President Trump does not act quickly and he concedes to a stolen election, Russia will ally with China. If America allows Biden and Kamila to take power, the Clintons, Soros, Rockefellers, Gates, Bezos, Zuckerbergs, and all other traitors behind the scenes will utterly annihilate any remnant of America that exists. We will have foreign Chinese and Russian troops brought in for, quote, humanitarian support or, quote, medical aid by the radical left to bring American sovereignty under the fist of the satanic communist UN that has China as their military. They will implement their system of radical, atheist, social, social, societal destabilization, calling all opponents white supremacists and racists. They will enact the UN program of lowering the sexual age consent limit to 10 years old. They will poison our children with hatred for freedom and America. And they will take control of all manufacturing and means of production. They will begin to do population replacement filling our country with communist Chinese like they have done in Tibet, in Hong Kong, and like they are now doing in South Korea. The totalitarians of the world cannot have the example of America, the most prosperous and powerful superpower in the world, continue to undermine their communist systems. We as Americans must stand against this scourge of evil if not the Christian patriots and the gun owners and every responsible person, then who? If we do not stand for America and capture the enemies within, at its darkest hour, we will fade into oblivion as the shame of history. God is calling America and the body of Christ to become kings and priests and to accept the rod of iron, Psalm chapter 2, that is bestowed upon us to rule the nations in a pomino reign, which means to shepherd the nations of the world to spread the gospel, freedom, liberty, the Second Amendment, and morality rooted in God and Christ to the ends of the earth. Only when the world has the love of Christ, the ethics of Christ, to love God and love your neighbor and is responsibly armed, can humanity finally keep government in its proper place.
the servant and not the master. We thank you and salute you all for your patriotism and love of God. Welcome to the second day of the Rod of Iron Freedom Festival. God bless you and God bless America. That was some timeline, but certainly establishes that communism is deadly to your health. I'd like to call the speakers, speakers that are speaking today. We're going to have a photo op, so if you would please line up speakers speaking today. So, have you ever wondered why some of the other countries don't have the high death rates that America does? Alan Keyes told me yesterday, it's because of chlorine dioxide, which is called hydrochloroquine. hydrochloroquine. He said it's great against the Kung flu, the Wuhan flu, or Corona-19. But what it's like is like OxyClean. For those of you that do laundry, the OxyClean has extra oxygen in it. That's how simple this hydrochloroquine is that Dr. Keyes takes every day. So it provides extra oxygen and stops the cell reproduction of the coronavirus. So guy's, uh, guy's brilliant. But at this point, Pastor Sean is going to have a book signing. The book signing for the Our Fathers Forsaken will occur at 1 p.m. right next to us. What's that? Oh, no photo op. Cancel the photo op, guys. I think we have enough photos of you. Also, continuing, at 1 p.m., our seminar series. We have John Guandalo at the tents next door, founder of Understanding the Threat of Islam. Along with communism, we also have the threat of Islam. Also at 1 o'clock, Kim Stolfer, founder of Firearms Owners Against Crime. He'll be discussing, does freedom matter in today's America, and are we on the verge of losing it? Once again at the tents next door, Dr. Richard Pranzer. He also has a, a title of the Leftist Attack on American Identity. The left is out to destroy America, and it's part of the Victory Over Communism lecture series that's at the memorial building and right next door here we have gun appraisals if anybody brought their firearms their sidearms you can have them appraised right next door here uh let's see what else i'd like to say we went from don't tread on me to don't breathe on me so it, america is certainly at a crossroads uh throughout the day we'll be having seminars here we'll have another announcement at about 1 p.m we are going to have a, uh, I believe it's a, I think it's a jujitsu demonstration, which we'll be having the mats are right there. But at this point, I want to thank everyone. If you noticed, the sound has been fantastic. No feedback. Everybody's been, been understandable. My hat's off to the sound team. These guys were absolutely great. And everybody else that helped with the, with the program. But I must mention our sponsors. So as I go through, if you need any of these services, please mention that you, you thank them for advertising because this is a rather expensive venue to put up. So first one is Chant Realtors. You see their signs all over locally. Chant Realtors supported us. Unfold Homes. You can reach them at unfoldhomes.com. We also have a special thanks to Timothy and Noshuk Elder and the Elder Kingship Mark Spowage. Also, Blue Ridge Communications TV, Grain to Glory. These guys make American flags out of wood, and they're at graintoglory.com. John Fetstock of Fry Fetstock Funeral Homes. If you're in need, these guys do a great job. Veterans can call nationalvethelp.com if you need a lawyer. That's nationalvethelp.com. Milford Chrysler Sales. Milford, if you need to lease a car, buy a car, need repairs, just mention, because everybody needs a car repair. Uh, Crowns.life, arts and craft shop, that's Crowns.life. And we also have the Rod of Iron Freedom Festival booth that has your uh, T-shirts and mugs and other neat things. Don't forget to stop by. Monuments by Paris, they're in Blakely, Pennsylvania. Monuments by Paris, they have a nice big showroom. And that's from Jason Paris, Jeffrey Paris, and Jonathan Paris. Also, Automax, 24-hour towing. They're right here in Lords Valley. Valley. Automax, Jack Ziegler Well Drilling. 
They're in Sterling, Pennsylvania. Jack Ziegler well drilling. Here's a great one. Eight hours of fishing for only 700 bucks. And that's from True World Tackle out in Bayonne, New Jersey. TrueWorldTackle.com. We also have the Americans, uh, the Veterans Traveling Tribute Wall. That's right next door. Please make sure to see that. Fish Tales for a Lifetime by Sun Moon Adventures. That's another fishing expedition. SunMoonAdventures.com. We also have Lancaster County Timber Lancaster County Timber Frames Incorporated. These guys make some neat wood homes. Landcoft.com. That's L-A-N-C-O-T-F.com. And we also have Great American Speakers by GreatAmericanSpeakers.com. Cindy's Gun Suites. If you guys like the Second Amendment, you want to give a great Christmas present that nobody else will have. Cindy's Gun Suites at cindysgunsuites.com. Grim Construction out of Waymark. Grim Construction. We also have Joy Beck Custom Builders. They build homes. That's at joybeckbuilders.com. Once again, Car Arms has sponsored this, so make sure to stop by the booth and the gun store next door. I did. I bought uh, a thousand rounds yesterday, so you always need that. And lastly, Camp Freedom. Camp Freedom sponsor is available at campfreedompa.org. So you have your seminars next door, you have the gun tent, you have everything else. Enjoy the rest of the day, and we will be giving you some announcements uh, a little bit uh, later. But the main stage, I guess our next event at 1 p.m., is going to be the uh, Rottweiler Freedom. Good. Yep, so the Rottweiler Freedom Festival Choir will be here at uh, 1 p.m. So, God bless y'all. We'll be talking to you soon.